to uh, looking at, starting to look at least, Revelation chapter 19. Our text this morning is Ephesians chapter 5. And that's what we'll be looking at before we get to Revelation 19. But we're looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, there's phraseology in here that we really confuses us uh, so often. And most of that is because of the ignorance of the doctrine of the church. So much of what we have to look at today is the doctrine of the church. For instance, the phrase, Bride of Christ, is not found in the Bible anywhere. But it is inferred in numerous places. So we find Jesus referred to often as the bridegroom, at least on several occasions. One being John 3.29 by John the Baptist. We'll look at that later. Therefore the disciples of, of John the Baptist would know of Jesus as, as the bridegroom. From John's teaching. We have the bride represented in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25.1-13. through 13. There were half of the virgins are prepared for the coming of the bridegroom and the other foolish half are totally unprepared. Uh, the, the ten virgins, of course, represent all believers of the church age. Jesus is obviously the bridegroom. Now, <laughs> little logic here, okay? There's no such thing as a bridegroom without a bride. The fact that there's a bridegroom assumes there's a bride. What makes a bridegroom is the anticipation of him taking his espoused bride. So a bridegroom uh, existence presumes there is a bride. So inductively, otherwise when we gather everything that the Bible has to say about a particular subject or particular doctrine, we can know that the idea of the marriage of the bridegroom and the bride is a spiritual union that is far beyond any measure of mere physical union. That's why marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Marriage even between a man and a woman. There is a union there that we is far more than a physical union in the eyes of God. Now we know this from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. Physical marriage between one faithful born-again man and one faithful born-again woman, and by the way, that is the only way marriage uh, is viewed in the Word of God, one man and one woman, is intended to represent the spiritual union that forms a partnership of the bride of Christ with her bridegroom as they share the rule of the nations during the kingdom age. Now, there's so much theological depth in this, it would take me hours and hours just to try to explain it. We've tried to do that over the years and I think we have presented it fairly uh, accurately and, and in detail but obviously we can't do that again this morning uh, otherwise we'd be here all morning just doing that. We will touch upon it. There will be a union and unity between the glorified Jesus Christ and his glorified disciples from the church age upon which the depth of such union, we can only speculate and offer opinions. The primary speculation is that the all glorified church age saints will literally and practically share the mind and heart of Christ in a miraculous and incomprehensible manner as they rule and reign with Christ. What do I mean by that? When Jesus thinks something, we'll know it. When we think something, he already knows it, right? Y'all believe that? That God knows the minds and hearts of us? We will have that kind of connection to him in our glorification. Now think about that for a while. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we had that today? Well, we do, you see. Only now you have to get it yourself. It's right here. The bride of Christ will become an interconnected network of glorified believers directly and spiritually connected to the mind and heart of Christ that will be so intricate that they will literally function as one person. 
And this is the way the church is designed to function during the church age, but fails because of the flesh. Once glorified, the believer's sin nature is eradicated, and then perfect unity can be uninterrupted. We'll have perfect fellowship with God. We will have his mind and heart. I mean, literally, in us. What he knows, we'll know. Now, Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is critical to understanding the bride of Christ. In this text, the wife represents all church age believers whose sole responsibility is to live in total submission to the will of Christ. The husband represents the Christ uh, during the church age, whose responsibility is to love like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So there's the two models. The reason why we don't have this model in the church is because we don't even have it in our homes today. The homes are broken down to the degree where husbands and wives, and we have rebellion against this, this uh, uh, role even in the church. Wives or, or, or mothers don't teach their children submission, uh, and husbands don't teach their children love. So children grow up not knowing how to love, and, uh, and growing up not, not, knowing, knowing not, not knowing how to submit to the Lord. Now look with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to invite you to stand if you are able. I'm going to read down through verse 27 from verse 22, and we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, you can be seated again. Now we're looking at the model, okay? Remember this is uh, as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Not, a, not into every everybody's husbands. Under your own husbands as unto who? The Lord. So you're to treat your husband like the Lord. We'll see that later on, reverence for husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Now notice he's the savior of the body. He's not the abuser of the body. And when he becomes an abuser, he steps out of alignment to what he does. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the Bible, by the word. It's not an automatic thing. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's God's intent for the church. Father God, as we again bow before you this morning, we are humbled in your presence. We know that you have promised where two or three are gathered together in your name, that there you are in the midst. And we do gather in your name today. It's our desire, Lord, to teach your word to your people. And I believe it is their desire to learn. For, Father, we know nothing of this will be accomplished today without the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray that he would be heard today, listened to, and your word would be opened and illuminated. We pray, Father, that you'd be glorified today in all that is said. And the people will know that's happening in the days ahead. All to the glory of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So we have this model here of the home, which is to model the church. And if we don't have the model in the home, it'll never be modeled in the church. So we pick up in verse 28, it says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it even as the Lord the church. Even as the Lord the church. And verse 30. For we are members of his body. Now, there is a spiritual aspect here in this text of the church. There is a physical aspect of the church that's local. And there is a spiritual aspect of the church. If you ignore that, you're going to become Baptist bride. Right? Because then the church is only physical. But there is a spiritual aspect of the church. We'll see that later on. Now, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a local church guy, but that doesn't mean I don't recognize that there is a mystical aspect to the church. Uh, the very fact that the church is mentioned in the Bible as a living temple of living stones. Is that physical or spiritual? It's obviously spiritual. In chapter 12 of uh, 1 Corinthians, obviously, we see there a spiritual. And so for, for Paul, second said, we are members of his body. Now, we, we know that that's not just talking about the local church, but a bigger view of his flesh and of his bones. That's just New Genesis, the church of the firstborn, which is mystical as of right yet. It's spiritual. It will become, it will become physical upon its rapture and glorification, but even then it'll be primarily spiritual because it'll be glorified. So he says, for no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it, cherisheth it, even as the Lord is church, for ye are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, spiritual union. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall he be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be, what? One flesh. There's a union. Not just a physical union, but what he's saying, it's more than a physical union. There's a spiritual union involved. And that is reflected usually in married vows. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So that is a reflection of this. Verse 30. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as Christ, uh, even as himself, and the wife See that she reverence her husband. You can't have the model of the church if you don't have the model in your marriage. And that is a critical thing. Now, uh, in Matthew 9, 14 through 15, when Christ was asked by John the Baptist's disciples why his disciples did not fast, he responded, can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Now, so therefore, by implication, Jesus calls the church, at this point embryonically existing in his disciples, his bride, and that the church age is referred to as the bride chamber, where the bride awaits uh, the coming of the bridegroom for the marriage service. So although this fact is almost completely lost in postmodern culture, the responsibility of the bride during the espousal period was sanctity and fidelity to the bridegroom. Compromising sanctity or fidelity disqualified the bride. We have a lot of people today who talk about the church as a bride. Now that is true. But there is a degree of that they must be sanctified and they must truly have fidelity to Christ. And that is, they must be faithful to the word of God. Beginning with the doctrine of salvation. Now there will be people, remember the ten virgins. They're virgins, otherwise they all were virgins. Five of them were ready, five of them weren't. But they all went. Now a parable of the talents. They were all given gifts. Some of them didn't do anything with it. Only the ones that were faithful are going to be rewarded. But that's, a self, that's not a salvation text. Don't make it one. Apostate Christianity is not concerned about how God feels about her unfaithful spiritual fornications and her doctrinal adulterations of the word of God. She's not even concerned about it. This fact should not surprise any faithful Christian. However, neither are any, many evangelicals concerned about their cohabitation with apostates in ecumenicism. It says, we read the, of the great whore and her daughters. Those are those she's produced. Those are apostates. They are people who are, are uh, of course, uh, in adulterous relationship to false doctrine. So the anomaly, anomaly of apostates and new evangelicals is not characteristic of the bride of Christ, who by the grace of Christ enabling keeps herself pure from these adulterations of God's word. By refusing to endure, endorse degrees of departure from those inspired words through gradual degrees of compromise. Now that brings us to Revelation 19, 1 through 10. Why do you suppose this follows the judgment of the great whore? 
Now, that you see what's going on on earth in the judgment of the great whore, religious apostasy. Now, in Revelation 19, 1 through 10, you're back in heaven. And you're seeing God bless the faithful. These are those who, who uh, uh, of course, rejoice over the judgment of the great whore in chapter 18. Now, look at this text. And after these things, after what? The judgment of the great whore. I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Now, what much what? Are you still with me here this morning? Okay. I heard a great voice of much people. Okay, remember that now. Saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Otherwise, he, it is all, all of the thanksgiving of this is directed that way. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. That's a doctrinal uh, adulterations. And hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up from forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and four beasts, uh, that's the cherubim around the throne of God, four and twenty elders, that's the twelve leaders of the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles, they fell down and worshipped God that sat upon, uh, sat on the throne saying, Amen, or so let it be, Hallelujah. And a voice, now again, not Christ, because he, re, he re, uh, not Christ, because this voice rejects worship, verse 10, most probably one of the four cherubim or one of the elders, I think it's probably one of the elders, came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a multitude, as the voice of many waters. That's the idea of waters rushing up to the shore. And as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent, all powerful reign. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the things. This is why brides dress in white. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now remember we have the bride, which is the church, and we have the friends of the bride, which is the, the Old Testament saints. And so he says, And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, this voice that spoke. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Some people said that Jesus was saying this. Well, no. He says, I have the testimony. I have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the scene is in heaven. And just prior to the second coming of Jesus at Armageddon, the establishment of the millennial kingdom on earth, tribulation is almost over. The three series of seven judgments of God upon this Christ-rejecting world are completed. The great whore and spiritual Babylon, apostate religion headed by Roman Catholicism, have been destroyed by the new ten federation uh, formed by the Antichrist. Revelation 19.1 introduces us to the celebration around the throne of God. And those participating are clearly distinguished as people. Not angels. Because the angels aren't redeemed. And so they don't celebrate the redemption. Only those who have a new birthday are there to celebrate the redemption. And this is your first birthday in heaven right here. These people are the bride of Christ, his church, undoubtedly and inductively. Now, is the Old Testament nation of Israel referred to as the wife of God? Yes, but this is the bride of Christ, and that's different. And although the functional representation of the bride of Christ in the church age during the church age dispensation 
is always local. Otherwise, we have seven epistles of Christ written to seven local churches. There is a mystical or spiritual aspect of the church as it represents all born-again Christians during the church age. We certainly find that in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 through 31. And if you go and read that whole text, you'll see it very clearly. Therefore, we cannot understand the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19 without a dispensational understanding of ecclesia of the church age. Ecclesia is a word that is translated church often in the Bible. It is better translated assembly, the called out ones. They are called out to assemble. And there are three main beliefs about ecclesi ecclesiology, which is the study of the doctrine of the church. What, once again, it's called ecclesiology. It's a study of the doctrine of the church. So there are three main beliefs about ecclesiology in the scriptures listed according to their predominance. I'm going to give them to you. And although the majority view is seldom the correct view theologically. Why? Because Satan is a deceiver. Now I believe everybody at the beginning of the church age had the church right. But Satan begins to progressively corrupt doctrine and divide and divide and divide and divide. If we had one church today that was a New Testament church, it would be patterned after the Baptists, which were the Old Testament sons of righteousness uh, that came and were the establishers of the synagogues of the Old Testament, and the church is patterned after the synagogue, not the temple. Don't let people tell you that the sons of righteousness of the Qumran Valley and those who authored the Dead Sea Scrolls were Essenes. That's Roman Catholicism, ways of marginalizing them and radicalizing them into a cult. They were not. They were people who believed very much like we do about uh, doctrine of grace, salvation by faith, justification by faith, uh, and their view of the future. Let's look at the first one. The universal mystical church view with two different accentuations. Otherwise, the church is universal and it is mystical. There's a Catholic church. Catholic simply means universal with local emphasis, uh, with minor focus on mystical. So all Catholicism is a successionist church, believing in apostolic successionism. It follows a pattern that the church is succeeded. Apostles are succeeded in the pope and in the hierarchy of, of uh, their bishops, and this goes on down through the generations, and so there is a successionist view uh, in this view. But there are two different accentuations or two different focuses. Uh, the Catholic Church is local with minor focus on mystical. And the focus of mystical is mostly in the mysteries, which is their sacraments. Second uh, part of that universal mystical view is the Protestant mystical church emphasis with minor focus on the local. The Protestant church views, there's a view of a more of a mystical view of the church and very little focus on local. There is local churches in denominations, denominational churches. The second view is a local church view with major focus on the local, minor focus on the mystical. That is dispensational. That is the view to which I believe Scripture teaches, and we'll see it here in a little while. Then the third view, a major view, there are all different variations of this, which is known as landmarkism or successionism. That took the view of Roman Catholicism and successionism. Instead of the succession being through apostles, now it was succession through baptisms. And you had to be able to trace your baptism back to through a lineage of churches that goes back to John the Baptist. Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, and therefore all the succession of churches have to be baptized in churches who are the person doing the baptizing uh, has a lineage or succession, what we call chain, link chain linkers, that goes back to John the Baptist. And that, of course, was um, propagated by a man by the name of Dr. Graves, who wrote the, chain of, uh, the Trail of Blood and uh, tried to train that all back. That is not uh, a biblical position, although I know a lot of men in this position that I love and appreciate 
Uh, I'm not uh, going to cast them off into the realms of total apostasy. I think it's a serious doctrinal error, but uh, I, I would I want to help them. And as looking and studying this doctrine, it's impossible for me to reconcile that view with Scripture. So their view, their focus, the Baptist Bride position, is total focus on the on the local church only, and they make water baptism efficacious to being part of the church. You must be baptized in a brighter church in order to be recognized to be part of the bride, and therefore they make water baptism efficacious. There's only one efficacious baptism in the Bible, and that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So having laid this foundation, we can come now to the bride and have a little bit of understanding. Now we've just barely touched upon all of this. We could spend hours and hours and hours discussing this. I have a book 250 pages long on this. It would take me months and months and months to teach through it. But the doctrine of the church must be understood inductively. Otherwise, we gather everything that the book, the Bible has to say about it. Grammatically, understanding what the words mean. Practically, how the church functions in its organization. Church is both an organization and an organism. And eschatologically, as it develops from one dispensation to another. So, for instance, we have the church of... In the wilderness, that is the nation of Israel, which we call the church. Is that the New Testament church? No, it's not. We have the church in the kingdom age. Is that the New Testament church? Trick question. Yes, it is, but it's different. Now it goes from the focus from purely local, or mainly local to, and partly spiritual, to their all spiritual and, and, and local, only secondary, although there will be a local aspect of it because it will be ruling physically. So we have these dispensational transitions. That's eschatological. Therefore, the only correct view of the church as the bride of Christ is the second view that I gave you, the local church view, with major focus on the local, minor focus on the mystical. Grammatically, the ecclesia is an assembly. And the mystical church is never assembled, will not, and do, uh, will not uh, do so until the rapture takes place. That's its first assembly. The mystical church is being built and is not yet complete. Otherwise, it won't be complete till the last soul is saved before the rapture and God calls them all, meets it, meet it in the air. So practically, the local church view, with major focus on local, minor focus on the mystical, is the only view that fits congregational polity, this is practical now, and local church discipline. You can't have a congregational polity if you don't have a congregation organization. You cannot have local church discipline unless you have a formal membership of a local church. There's a booklet back there called the membership, uh, local church membership. Take it home and read it and give it to a few people. Uh, so the commands to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace is only practical within a local church context and cannot even be measured with a mystical church context. Otherwise, how do you measure that? If that's happened. So almost all of the epistles are addressed to local churches to be circulated with other local churches. Eschatologically, the local church view transitions into purely mystical, spiritual view upon the rapture and the glorification of all born again, the church age believers. But only the local church view fits this eschatological model. So I'm only the local church view, but not local church only. You understand the difference? You see, what does that mean? Well, because I believe there is a mystical church being formed. And the mystical church is not going to, all the people who are in local churches will not be part of the mystical church. Because a lot of those people in mystical churches are not born again. In order to be part of the mystical church, you must be born again, uh, into the new Genesis uh, by the baptism of the Spirit of God. And that requires some very detailed specificity. And not all believers in local churches, maybe some even here today, are not born again people and they won't be part of the mystical church. So, and are not now part of the mystical church, otherwise they have not been baptized into the body of Christ. 
So I hope that hasn't been too confusing for you. If it is, I am available for home Bible studies. Okay? So it is a baptism with the Spirit that unites every born-again church age believer with the church as the mystical body of Christ. This church is primarily mystical or spiritual. Water baptism unites a born-again believer with the local church, and this is primary physical, primarily physical and temporal until the rapture, when the physical, when this transitions physically, uh, transitions into the primarily spiritual bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And this transition is primarily spiritual because there is a physical and temporal aspect of the church, as even when it rules and reigns with Christ during the kingdom age over a spiritual, physical kingdom on earth. So understanding all of these things, I don't know about you, it gives me a headache. Right? And if you think it gives you a headache, try wading through it in the scriptures. Because I've spent 50 years studying this. And if you don't get all of these things, you're going to be just nothing but confused. And I have all kinds of people that say, I'm going to stick my anchor in the ground right here, and here's where I'm going to stand, and that everything that else isn't anchored to my anchor, I'm going to push them away. But that's not our job. Our job is to find out where we're supposed to anchor and then persuade everybody that our anchor is the right anchor and to do it with gent gentleness and care. So, the transition here, the degree of authority of these believers over the kingdom age is then going to be determined by their faithfulness to the bridegroom during the church age. And now they've already received their rewards at the beginning of the kingdom age at the judgment seat of Christ. At the beginning of the church age. No, excuse me. At the beginning of the tribulation at the judgment seat of Christ. So they've received their rewards. So when they come back with Jesus, the bride of Christ comes back, they know exactly what uh, those rewards are going to be. They don't know yet what cities they're going to rule, but they know that they're going to get some rewards. So this rewarding for faithfulness is explained in the parable of the ten talents, or the talents, in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Not getting all this straight will mess up one's understanding of the marriage supper of the Lamb severely. And we have people that say, well, no, you have to be a Baptist who can trace your succession all the way back to John the Baptist. And if you don't have a line of churches that goes all the way back there, your baptism is not recognized and you won't be part of the bride of Christ. You can be, you'll be one of the friends of Christ, but that's not what the friends of Christ are. And so they have taken this and they've wrapped their, their theology around the scriptures and then read their theology into the scriptures. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Now, let's come here to, and look at these four things to which the believers give glory to God in uh, chapter 19, verse 1, 3, 4, and 6. In Revelation 9, 1, the bride of Christ forms the hallelujah chorus, singing praises to their bridegroom, Jesus Christ. So it is the bride that sings praises to the bridegroom. I want you to see this. Hallelujah is transliterated from the Hebrew and means praise Jah or praise Jehovah or God. The only use of the word in the Bible, in, in, in the New Testament, hallelujah, is in Revelation 19, 1, 3, 4, and 6. In the Old Testament books, this phrase is translated praise God or praise the Lord. Here it is just translated hallelujah. The praise of the church age saints is given for four specific blessings of God's grace to them. That means God did it all. You have absolutely nothing to do with it. Therefore, you shouldn't receive any praise for it. God is alone to be praised. Now, you probably won't realize that fully until you finally get to glory and you realize how wicked a sinner you really are and were. When I say are, even if you are a saved sinner, you're just a saved sinner saved by grace. If you are a sanctified sinner, it is because God positionally sanctified you and practically enabled you with the help of his Holy Spirit to live a sanctified life. 
So you don't really deserve anything except the healing your will to God. So the praise of church age saints is given for four specific blessings of his grace to them. And hallelujah is exuberant thanksgiving. It's not. Oh, hallelujah. You're going to have an understanding here right now. You are about ready to come back with Jesus Christ to rule and reign with the, with the Lord. You are about to come back with the battle of Armageddon. You are following the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. The, he who is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and you're going to be riding behind him on his white horse, and you're coming back knowing exactly what's going to happen, and out of that comes an exorbitant, hallelujah! Sorry if I woke anybody up. But if you understand that today, your life ought to be an hallelujah right now. The first one is salvation. The first Alleluia chorus is about salvation. We know that it is totally of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you ever look at that verse of scripture? I, I always say that is, reminds me of that sign, the office, the, the office of redundancy office. Because it is redundant, isn't it? For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works. That's an imaginable. It's redundant. Why? Because God wants you to redundantly understand that you have nothing to do with your salvation. It's not of yourself. It's not of works. You are saved by grace. It's a gift of God. It's redundant. It's redundantly redundant. And so therefore you ought to praise God for your salvation. I remember my life as a young man. And uh, I had a lot of fears of hell. I, don't, I had some belief in God. And uh, I prayed. I read, tried to read the Bible. Never could get much out of it. And every time I'd have some great difficulty in my life, I'd run back to the Bible and try to read it. But I couldn't understand much of what it said. But then one day, I, my wife invited me to go to church. I heard the gospel was born again. It's like somebody turned the lights on. And understanding came alive. Oh, my, that's so simple. That's right there. See, when you're reading in the darkness, uh, you can't understand spiritual things. When the Spirit of God opens your eyes to understanding, then you can. And this is the spiritual understanding. I can't save myself. Grace alone can save me. Otherwise, it's a gift of God. That's what grace is. It's a gift. The second thing is glorification. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What's the song about glorification? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. He's not talking about progressive sanctification here. He's talking about something completely different. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, about the time it takes your eye to catch a, a beam of light, and that's faster than electricity flows. In that moment, at the trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised, and corruptible shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You're going to know that that moment that a miracle is taking place in your life, you're going to be transformed. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are, the, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Otherwise, the way we appear now is not the way we're going to appear. But we know that when he, Jesus, appears at his coming for us, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be glorified. We're going to know that's not anything we did. We didn't recreate ourselves. John 17, 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. It's a gift. And you're going to understand it when you have it. You're going to say, wow. <laughs> that they may be one, even as we are one. That is part of your glorification. Not just to be changed, to be like him. You're going to be literally like him. There's going to be a union and a unity that you could never imagine. 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace, 
who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. What's that? Glorification. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this pleasant, present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wow. The third is honor. Honor is the honor that God deserves. Let us be glad, Revelation 19.7 says, and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint. What is this talking about? How many weddings have you been uh, to where everybody says, well, look at the bridegroom. Isn't he handsome? No, he's just a stooge standing up there for everybody else. And the, whole, the whole prominence of, of a wedding service is focused upon who? And the bride. As she walks down that aisle. And the, bri the bridegroom stands up there with drool running down his cheek. And, and uh, in anticipation of that kiss when he gets to kiss her. Mm. Oh, but that's not here. Honor goes where? To the bridegroom. The bride will be putting all her focus on the, on the bridegroom. Now the bridegroom in a physical wedding, he wants all the focus on the bride. Why? Because... His focus is on the bride. Quite frankly, we had hundreds of people in our wedding. I don't remember any of them. I remember my bride walking down the aisle. I always cry at weddings. <laughs> John 14, verse 1. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. What's it, what's this? this is the bridegroom talking to his bride. I'm going to come. I prepared a home for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto, my, unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's going to be the focus right now. They're coming back with the bridegroom. He's prepared a place for them. Now, of course, he's this kingdom age, and then, of course, later on, the New Jerusalem. And then the fourth one is power or authority. That's kingdom rule. It says in Revelation 2.26, And he that overcometh, we overcome by faith and faithfulness, and keepeth my works unto the end. So there's two qualifications. First, you have to get saved. Second, you have to be faithful. To him will I give power over the nations. And he, the one that overcometh, the one that is saved and faithful, shall rule them, the nations, with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they, the nations, be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. This is a tremendous, wonderful truth. Here, now, are you going to wait till glory to sing Hallelujah. <laughs> is it going to take that long to you for you to really to become exuberantly thankful to God for what is the gift of your salvation? For it is much more than a fire escape, my friend. It goes far beyond that. And we ought not to be selfish with it, understanding that whosoever will may come. There are thousands and thousands of people out there. They think that that church is just about getting out of hell. It's a get out of hell free card. That's not what church is. Church is the bride of Christ. And before you can be part of the bride of Christ, you must be born again. Because it is a done by the baptism with the Spirit of God. And you're made part of something that's so much bigger than you that it is beyond human comprehension. And God deserves a hallelujah chorus for that. Be saved today. Repent of your sin and your dead works. Stop trusting in your sacraments 
and uh, your church to save you because it will not. In fact, it will make you twofold more the child of hell than the Pharisees were. Second, you must uh, believe that God's wrath has been once and for all satisfied in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and his blood satisfied the wrath of God upon your sin, every single one, not just original sin, but every sin you committed has been paid for, and the sin penalty upon that sin has been remitted through the blood of Jesus Christ. Believe in it. Rest in it. You must believe that God wants to gift you his righteousness. You're not saved by your righteousness or self-righteousness. You are saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the only way to get that is to have it gifted. That's the doctrine of justification. Believe that. Rest in it. Second or third, you must confess that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God incarnate in human flesh. And therefore he is Lord. He is the creator of human earth, earth and heaven. And when you confess him as Lord, you recognize him as the creator of heaven and earth and that you are responsible to submit to his lordship. Fourth, you must call upon the name of the Lord Jesus out of absolute desperation, meaning you have no hope in any other way than to call upon him to save you, to rescue you, to redeem you. And in calling, he promises for whosoever shall receive him, to them will he become give power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Then and only then are you born again. There's no other way. It's not multiple choice. It doesn't. You don't get to make it up as you go along. Way that's the only way. For neither is there salvation uh, in any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. Jesus said that he was a truth in the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. There's no other way. So not many faiths. There's one faith, and that's defined very specifically in the word of God. Be saved today that way, because that's God's way. That's the only way he'll honor. You can't come to him and say, well, here's the way I'd like to do it. God said, I'm not, God's not going to let that happen. He says, here's the way I said to do it, and this is the only way it's acceptable. So be born again. Our Father God, as we close this morning, and thank you so much for uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, and for the doctrine of the church in the Bible. Lord, we know Satan's confused it greatly, taking something that's very simple and made it very complex. And we praise you, Father, for uh, your working in our lives. We pray for any here today or listening online who need to be born again, that they'd repent, believe, Confess, call, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we